Now, the other major policy that New York is mm -hmm. quite famous for, for fighting against high prices, is, is rent control. Right. Uh, fairly universally denigrated by, mm -hmm. by economists, but again, it serves some of the other functions that you're, that you're talking about in terms of creating some integration in the, in the city. At this point, there may be 20,000 units in New York City that are sort of governed by the strict, uh, the, you know, the old-fashioned strict rent control so how, system. How does, and how does the difference no. between strict rent control so, and rent stabilization? So, um, the, the major difference is, is just in terms of the, um, the the allowances in terms of increasing rent. So basically, rent stabilized apartments are um, generally um, given a rent gr increase every year, but it's governed by the by the rent guidelines board, which basically is supposed to take a look at sort of what what up what's happened to operating costs and and try to and this in are they allowed more freedom if you change tenant in yes, terms of raising and you're increase? and you're allowed a vacancy deal allowance and in fact if the, if you then make um, individual apartment repairs you're allowed to increase um, rents. Um, there's also a, a luxury decontrol, so once the rent gets to a certain level, if either, um, if, if it then becomes vacant, then it can leave rent stabilization altogether. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and if you look at the, you know, if you look at the numbers, I mean, I feel like part of my response to the sort of controversy about, and it's one of the third rails of, you know, for housing policy in, in New York City, is that it's not outside of Manhattan, it's just not having as big an effect on the market, I think, mm -hmm. as, as people think. I mean, really, the rent stabilized rents are not that different mm -hmm. from maybe they're two hundred dollars. That's like eleven hundred versus thirteen hundred dollars in terms of sort of the median um, rents of the market rate rentals versus the rent stabilized rentals. Um, right now, I mean, just just to go through it, we should probably mm -hmm. should just say the things that economists yeah. have often hated about right. about yes. rent control. Right. So yeah. first of all, there's the supply effect. Right. So presumably, mm -hmm. this means that you want to build less. Right. Typically, the rules were written so that you didn't have rent stabilized apartment prices on new that's units right. being built. So that that's, that's one right. way that the rules try to avoid that problem. Yep. You also have a supply effect if the units are converted from rentals to cooperatives mm -hmm. uh, or then condominiums. And mm -hmm. we certainly saw this in the post-war period, right? Yep. I mean, a lot of even the grandest buildings on Park yep. Avenue were, were built as, as rents and then converted uh, laboriously to, um, to, to an owner-occupied yeah. structure. Then there's the quality effect. Right. And that, we think, is probably less important in New York today. But certainly, if we think back to our youth in the 70s, yeah. there were a lot of those grand buildings, on, particularly on the west side, right. which you know were rent controlled. And the owners had decided it just didn't make any sense to maintain them. And yeah. then there's the sort of more, you know, the, the, the issue about the allocation of the apartments, yeah. which is an area where, where yeah. I've worked. Where my favorite anecdote on this is from Ken Aletta's The Streets Are Paved With Gold, mm -hmm. where he talks about Nat Sherman, the tobacconist to the, to the world, is living in this, I think it's a central park. West apartment, yeah. which he's paying nothing for, and he says, "You know, I think it's fair because I use it so rarely." Right. And, and of course, <laughs> what that means is he's only getting that much value out of it, yeah. and that may well be true. But you know, there's somebody else who would get a whole lot more value out of it out yeah. of him because of rent yeah. control. He can't monetize yeah. this benefit yeah. that he has. And, and I think I would say two things to that. I mean, I think the last point is the one that troubles me the most. Right? Is the fact that that. Um, you know, there, there's there's no means testing mm -hmm. in rent stabilized units, so there's there's no mechanism through which we can assure that the people who really need the apartments are getting those low rent apartments, and so it creates this sort of bifurcated um, housing market where you've got the lucky and you've got the unlucky, right? You got the lucky who live in, you know, are able to get a rent stabilized unit, um, but like you said. It's not as though those differences are as as extreme as, as people right. think anymore. Um, it it also is true that you know that the on average rent the tenants living in rent stabilized apartments are lower income mm -hmm. than those living in, in in market rate apartments. So, um, but that being said, right, and so I think people exaggerate sort of through these anecdotes, think right, that it's right. like everyone who lives in a rent stabilized apartment is is a billionaire. Right. Um, <laughs> that's clearly not true. On the other hand, um, you know, I do think that the my biggest concern about rent stabilization is the lack of means testing. Now, some of these issues about means testing often come up in the rise of the affordable housing units created by inclusionary zoning as, yeah. as well. Right. So this has been a, a new phenomenon. Tell us how yeah. this tell yeah. us how this works. And, and yeah. you know, you can imagine two effects on affordable housing. Yeah. One of which is you're actually creating some tangible units. The second, which is right. it is still a tax on development, and we don't right. get more development usually by taxing right. it. Right. So we've had sort of two kind two versions of this in New York. Mm -hmm. One is in a voluntary program where basically. Um, builders were incentivized to add in affordable housing units through a density bonus, so they could mm -hmm. build higher, they could build more if mm -hmm. they included some share of, of you know, twenty percent of their units mm -hmm. um, affordable. And then, more recently, De Blasio has 
um, the de Blasio administration has proposed and it's been passed, a, a mandatory inclusionary housing program that basically kicks in with any kind of rezoning. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so in that case, basically a developer is required to, to um, include a, a certain number of certain share, and there's you know different formula depending on. Um, and how are those means tested? Um, if at all? Those those are means tested. Those are means tested again. It it, it varies depending on the the, the rules, but it I um, mean you know what the income level is targeted to. There's sort of a, a menu of different options, but but those are means tested. And will they be um, continually? So if you get in at a lower income and then become richer, do you have to move out or, um, or pay more? Or it's no, just but it's sort of on reoccupancy. I see. You so would, they would be means tested. One reason that I, I think that um, place-based subsidized housing. Um, may actually be important is, is one is that it provides some level of it locks in some economic diversity to to neighborhoods um, that um, may be in especially important in cities like New York that are seeing rapidly rising rents and but for that place-based subsidized housing um, we would likely see these cities become basically islands of the islands of the wealthy. So and rent control in New York feels very different than rent control in a declining city like a New York. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that it's not even clear that sort of just kind of a, a housing voucher only approach would um, would work that well in New York, um, given the given the sort of the the, the market because you would pressures. push the, vo the vouchers off to the yeah, off to the That's edges. right, and and I think that ultimately, I mean, I think that you know what what I worry about is that in um, that without that a lot of what the uh, gives New York um, the vitality that we all love about it is the is the diversity of, of the residents of New York is the diversity of the population. So in the same sense that we like historic preservation because it prov yeah. provides a diversity of aesthetics we that's like right. the diversity that's created by these various interventions in the housing market in terms of the people yeah, who live in the city. Yeah that's exactly right. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay.